Tonight we are in the book of Job. Grab the note sheet, hold it up, and wave it at me. Okay, how many of you have, by raise your hands, how many of you have ever been to a play at some point or another in your life? Just put your hands up. A lot of people have gone, okay. So when you think about a play for a, se a second, just stay with me. Think about a play for a second. You have what's going on backstage, back here. You've got like the, 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 the prop guys are back here working on things. They're going to make sure. And then you've got the front stage. You've got the actual play where it's all happening. But you never get to see backstage, do you? You only get to see what? Come on, say front stage. Front stage. You, don't, you don't get to see backstage, but is there stuff going on back here? Yes or no? Yeah. Oh, man, there's so much going on back here, but you never get to see it. You only get to see what's going on on the stage. Now, the book of Job is exactly that. The book of Job is telling you that in this world... There is a front stage, the things that you can see, the physical, the physical reality of our world, the physical life that you live. And there is, truthfully, there is a backstage in which angels, demons, God are actually at work behind the curtain and you never get to see this. And the reason why you go through pain and suffering, because... We all do. We all go through pain and suffering, yes or no? Yes. Is because there's actually a war going on behind the curtain, and you don't ever get to see it. And every time you go through hardship, there's more going on than you realize. Come on, say, there's more than I realize. More. Say it again. Look at the person next to you and say, there's more than you realize. There is more going on than you realize in every pain, in every disappointment, in every confusion, in every circumstance. There's, it's not just what you see. There's so, come on, say so much more. That's what the book of Job is designed to tell you. That when you go through cancer, or you go through divorce, or you go through disappointment, or you're really confused, and you can't figure out how to make good decisions, and everything really, like when you're going through something that's struggling, or hardship, or adversity, it's not just what you can see that's truly going on. There's always something going on. Come on, say behind the curtain. That's the truth of the world that you and I dwell in. And the book of Job is designed to help you see what's behind the curtain. So you're going to get a glimpse. God's going to pull back the curtain. And he's going to show you the war going on. He's going to show you angels and demons and Satan at work over one guy's life, this guy named Job. So we're going to pray and we're going to do it. You ready to go? Yeah. Lord Jesus, thank you for every life. We pray that you'd bless them and encourage them. Thank you that we get to come to church tonight and hear your word. God, there's so much that we need to understand about pain, suffering, hardship, why the world is the way it is. Those are good questions that we need answers to. May this help us as we study the book of Job. Everybody say, my heart's open. My mind's ready. Make me better, God. Transform me with your word. Lead me now, Jesus. All those people said? Amen. Amen. All right, so we're going to go through just a couple facts real quick before we get to the meat of this. So uh, Job is the 18th of, book, of 66 books. The author of the book of Job is unknown. It's written by somebody who was an eyewitness to the events and conversations recorded in the book. So we don't actually know who wrote the book. The type of literature is it's history. That's what it says on the screen. It says history. But I also want you to write down poetry. Because... Most of Job is a poem about pain. So it is a historical book. It's the story of how Job, uh, about how, how Job is the story of, of Satan's attack against him and how he keeps his faith through pain and adversity. But it is also a poem that it was recited by the ancient Hebrews for generations to help understand and wrestle through problems, pain, and suffering. Date of writing, it's actually the oldest book in the Bible. It is older than Genesis. This is the oldest book in all of Scripture, probably written either around the time of Abraham, which is like 500 years before Moses, 600 years before Moses, or even before that. It could have been written at the, time, by the, time, at the same time they built the pyramids, which is about 2800 B.C. So anytime between, between 2800 and about 1900, so you have about a thousand year periods it could have been written in, but it is actually the oldest book. So Moses would have had a copy of this before he wrote Genesis. You know why? I think that's kind of cool. Because everybody goes through pain and this book's about how to deal with pain. 
every generation from the beginning of time till now goes through stuff that sucks. And so God's like, hey, I need to give you some advice and some wisdom on how to handle the difficulties you face. The time period covered, nobody knows the, the period covered, but probably lived, Job probably lived during the time of Abraham. We're not ac ac exactly sure, but the idea is that is from that era. Now, the big idea of Job, there is a spiritual and physical side of adversity. There is a spiritual and a physical side of adversity. I just talked about it a second ago. That every time you're dealing with something in the natural, there's still something going on in the supernatural behind the curtain. You just can't see it. There's always something physical and spiritual going on in every situation. Now, what we're going to talk about first is actually, or Job talks about first, is what it talks about what's going on back here. So before it even talks about the physical, it starts to talk with a conversation about with, with, with God and the devil or Satan and angels in a heavenly realm that you never get access to. So we're going to start by reading the book of Job. Here we go. This is Job 1.1. Here's how the story starts. There was a man in the land of Uz, that would be ancient Canaan area, so near the land of Israel, whose name was Job. And the man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. So super good dude, probably better than you. <laughs> in fact, if you read it, like, he, like the, you, you hear in the text that he's, he's basically at the time probably the, the kindest, gooder, gooderest person of the, of the era. <laughs> he's gooder than you. <laughs> now, we'll go to verse 6. So here's what it says next. This is, now we're going backstage. Now there was a day when the sons of God, that would be angels, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. So you got heaven, angels are coming in, Satan gets to walk right in too, because he's an angel. He's a bad one, but he's an angel, and he gets access to heaven. And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? So Satan answered and said to the Lord, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth in it. Or basically, I've been wandering around the planet because you kicked me out of heaven. And I'll just be a reminder for a second that Satan is someplace on this earth right now. He was kicked out of heaven to the earth. It's why he was so ticked off that he corrupted Adam and Eve. He is someplace on planet earth right now. Someplace at work, presently. Uh, but walking back and forth on earth. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Hey, have you thought about Job? He's a pretty cool guy. There's no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. Like, have you ever thought about Job? So Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him? Have you not protected him and around his household and around all that he, and, uh, and around all that he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands and his possessions and have increased in the hand. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will surely curse you to your face. So you got this conversation. Behind the curtain, Job and uh, God and Satan are talking. And God's like, hey, that guy's pretty awesome. And Satan's like, that's because you're so nice to him. Stop being nice or let me kick him around for a while. And I bet he just curses you. And so God allows Satan to mess with Job. First thing I want you to write down, number one, number one. God, Satan must get permission to, permission to mess with God's people. Satan must get permission to mess with God's people. If you study the story, Satan just can't attack Job because he wants to. He has to get God to allow him to. So in Job 1 verse 12, the very next verse, the Lord said to Satan, behold, all right, you think he's going to wimp out and curse me? Try it. Behold, all that he has is in your power. You can try it. You can attack him, which tells you something. If you go through pain and hardship, it's because God is allowing it into your life. Satan cannot touch you without God's permission. Yep. He just can't. It just tells you that the, the, it's like we're not dealing with like a yin and yang here. We're not like good and evil are equal. God is so much greater than evil that for Satan to fight with God, he has to get permission from God. Hey, say, hey, God, can I fight you? And God's like, okay, fine, go ahead and hit. But if, if God goes, no, you can't hit me, Satan's like, fine, and he just, just has to leave. He's not allowed to do anything that God does not allow. He cannot do anything that God do, does not give him permission to do. So you've never been through any sort of pain 
that God did not first allow. Ever. Because these conversations are happening behind the curtain before they ever happen to you. Now that then leads us to a second thing. Number two, if God gives permission, God must believe that we can handle it. If God gives permission, he believes you're not a wuss. Come on, say, I'm not a wuss. Look at the person next to you and say, neither are you. <laughs> when you go through a health issue, when somebody's mean to you at work, when somebody is, we all go, we get lied about. When, like, there's, it, there's, a, there's a multitude of evil things that happen in the world, yes or no? Yeah. God believes you have such a strong character that you have such a strong backbone that you can handle it and not wimp out. That you are an overcomer and not a wuss. That when pain and hardship happen, he's like, oh, yeah, you can, you can attack them because they ain't giving in. They're getting past this. They're going to they're gonna conquer this. They're going to go beyond this. So think about this. Think about it from this angle for a second. So church is usually a place where you're like, hey, you need to, you need to believe in God. That's what we say. Come on, believe in God. Heaven is going, I believe in you. Come on, I believe in you. You can handle this. You can get beyond this. You're better than that. You're going to overcome this. Don't, don't lay there and die. Rise past this. This is how heaven views you when you're going through adversity and pain and suffering. God believes you. Come on, say, I can handle it. He would never give you anything that he thought you were going to wuss out on. He thinks that you can handle it. So, now, in the text, Satan now has permission. So he begins to attack Job. In fact, I'm going to put it on the screen just so you get, catch the idea of what, what happens with these attacks. Satan puts the ideas in bad guys' heads to go steal all Job's stuff and murder all Job's employees. That, that's what happens first. So he gets permission from God. You can mess with Job. So a bunch of his stuff gets stolen, a bunch of Job's employees get killed. Satan then drops fire from heaven and destroys a bunch more of Job's stuff. Satan uh, again puts the idea in bad guys' heads to come and steal Job's stuff and murder all Job's employees. That happens a second time. Satan then manipulates the weather. It's a windstorm and kills Job's family in a natural disaster. So his kids get killed. And then Satan gives Job a disease and he ends up with this horrible disease. So by the time you're to J Job's 2 verse 7, he's homeless. His kids are gone. He had gone from wealthy to poor, and he has a disease sitting in the gutter. In fact, I'm going to read all these verses to you. I just want you to hear them for a second. Just listen as I read this stuff so you hear, you hear the story. Now, there was a day when the sons and daughters of Job were eating and drinking wine in the oldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job and said, the, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were, donkeys were feeding alongside them. And then the, then the Sabaeans, a bunch of bad guys, raided them, and they took, a, they took everything. And then they killed all the servants with the edge of the sword. And I'm the only one that's left to escape. While he's still speaking, another, uh, another servant came running in and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up all the, all the sheep and the servants and consumed everyone. And I'm the only one that escaped. Like literally Satan dropped fire from heaven and consumed everything. Uh, while he was still speaking, another one came and said, the Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and took all the camels and took them all away. And by the way, they killed all the servants with the edge of the sword. And I'm the only one that's escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, another one came running in and said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in the older brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house and it fell on the young people and they're all dead. And I'm the only one that's escaped. What we call natural disasters are not natural. Front stage, backstage. Satan manipulates the weather, causes people to think up, I should steal and kill. Oh, you know, like crime. And those people had no idea that what was going on backstage was actually the enemy dropping those thoughts into their brain. So they think, hey, I got a cool idea. I'm gonna go steal Job's stuff and kill his servants. And they thought they thought that, they thought that up. The devil went and dropped that in the brain. By the time you're to chapter 2, verse 7, the last one on here, Job's got boils. He's got a disease that Satan gave him. And he's covered in these boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. And he's taking pottery and he's scraping himself with all the pus. 
super, like the reason why this is the this is the first thing that God writes, I think, to humanity, is because we go through some severe pain. Yes or no? So he gives you an example of somebody who goes through terrible loss. Significant pain. Everything good falls apart. Everything that he thought was going to be right with the world is ruined. And then he tells you, hey guys, this happens because there's a backstage. There's an enemy. What's the en Jesus said the enemy came to steal, kill, and destroy. That's John 10. He came to steal, kill, and destroy. And then he says, I have come that you would have life and have it to the full. But there is an enemy out to steal and kill and destroy your soul. To ruin your family, to ruin a marriage, to ruin your kids, to ruin your health. Back, come on, say backstage. backstage. Now, this is what Job is designed to teach you. But then, turn the page, turn the little, the little card over, the, or the little note sheet that I gave you, because on the other side of that card, now we have to talk about the physical realm, because Job has, gets the chance to respond to all that has happened. And this is Job chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. Now that he's in misery, then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head. That's an ancient sign for grief. And he fell to the ground, and he whined. Nope, he what? He what? He worshiped, and he said, naked, naked I have come from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. Blessed, not cursed, is the name of the Lord. Notice, God was not wrong. God believed in him, and he passed the test. Come on, say there's more going on. There's always more going on. When you go through a struggle or a trial, you're either going to pass or fail the test. When, when you're in it, it feels really, really painful. It feels like there's no light at the end of the tunnel. But you either decide to worship God in your pain or curse God and whine. Come on. And you don't solve anything whining. Nobody whines their way to victory. Amen. Nobody has whined their way to a better life. Nobody has got through their pain by complaining about it or mad at other people. The way you get through pain and suffering is, come on, say worship through it. You worship your way through it. Job chapter 2, verse 10, after he's got, now he's got boils too, he says, shall we not ex indeed accept good from God? And shall we not also accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. So what you have in every time you face a struggle or a trial, how you handle it is what God is after. I know they can do this. I know they can overcome this. I know they can get beyond this. He's already thinking this before you're even in it. And then when you're going through it, you can worship your way through it. You can praise your way through it. You can trust your way through it. But you're not going to whine your way to victory. You're not going to complain your way to a better life. You're not going to solve the problem by getting mad at everybody else and saying it's not fair and telling God how stupid he is. And it's not, you just don't win. You only become, a, you can either become bitter or better every time you have a problem. Every time you go through struggles, you either become bitter and get angry or you become a better person. I still remember when I first became a pastor, so I'm a youth pastor. I told you the story before. Uh, the guy that I worked with, his name was Bruce at the time, a different church. And his wife got cancer and that over the course of about six months, we watched her slowly pass away and she died. And he was older than me. He was, he was in his 60s, and I was in my 20s. And I said to Bruce, I said, how, how are you getting through? And he said, the only way I know how to get through this is I go in my room and I shut the door and I turn on worship music like what you just heard tonight. And he said, I get, to, I get on my knees and I put my hands in the air and I say, I will worship you through this. I don't understand it and I don't get it and it doesn't make any sense. And I can't see behind the curtain. But I will trust that you know what's going on. I will trust that you're good. And you love me. And you got a plan. And though I can't see back there past that curtain, you know what's going on. So I will worship through it. Amen. And this is how you survive the nastiness of this world. We can't get out of it. 
but we can trust that he knows what he's doing behind the curtain. Are you with me? So a couple thoughts. You can write these down if you want to. Job keeps his faith in God despite his pain and suffering. He keeps his faith in God despite his pain and suffering. Now I'm going to tell you another story. This, this, will, this might help some of you. So I was, uh, one time I got invited onto TVN, you know, the Christian broadcasting TV station or whatever, to talk about my book when it got released. And I'm in the green room backstage, and I'm going to get out and talk about Grace on Tap. And there's another dude back there, and he's, he's about ready to preach for a little bit in, on TVN too. And I said, hey, what, what, what you here talking about? He said, I'm talking about pain and suffering. I'm like, really? What, what, what are you talking about? He said, well, my story is, that I lost my dad in an accident, and two months later, I lost my 17-year-old son in an accident. I'm like, oh, bro, that's rough. And I'm talking about favor of God. <laughs> he's talking about pay. I mean, he's talking about the real stuff. And so I'm like, so how, how did you get through that? And here's what he said before he even went on the on the on the teach that night. He said, I did not question what I already knew about God to be true. I already knew that God was good. I knew that God loved me, and I knew that God has a plan, and I knew that God is in charge. So I did not question those things in the middle of my pain. If you do not question that you already know God is good, you can handle any pain that comes your way. But if in the middle of your crisis... You doubt the one thing you know to be true, he's good. No, maybe he's not good. If you doubt that, you just pulled all of the possibility of a foundation out, out from underneath you. Because now you're just angry, and now you're just bitter, and now you're just confused, and now you're just frustrated, and, and now you're just hurting more. And You can't solve pain by doubting God's goodness. If you doubt his goodness, you just give yourself more pain. Yeah. Is that clicking? And this is how Job gets through his stuff. Second, number two, Job discusses then for the next 41 chapters why there is pain and suffering. So when you read the book of Job, the first, three, the first two or three chapters are a story, and then the next 41 chapters are a poem in which him and three friends are discussing pain and suffering and why did this happen and how does this work and how do we get past this? And just don't you have those same kind of conversations, yes or no? Yeah. We all question, like when we're going through stuff, we, and so he's questioning, he's trying to figure it out, and he's trying to like, why am I in this? And you get at the end, God comes in and kind of solves it for him. So that's why you have to read the book. You have to go to chapter 41 and he kind of solves the whole thing and he shows him behind the curtain and he explains the whole thing and why he went through it. And like it, 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 God explains it. But I want to an answer this, this why is there problems and suffering and pain in a way that might help you for a second. So is God good, yes or no? Yes. What is good for a second? Good is the absence of evil. If there is no evil, what's good? The only way you know what good is is because you know what you know what bad is. If the, if if everything was good and there was no bad, God would be better than nothing. God's good. How do you know? There's nothing else. In order to know what good is, you have to know what evil is. Yes or no? Yeah. Yes. Otherwise, as we say, God's good, God's great. He's better than what? Nothing. Well, then he's not really good, is he? See, pain and suffering has to happen. Otherwise, you would never be able to know what good is. It would be impossible because you've never experienced bad. You wouldn't know what good is. Is that making sense? Yeah. It doesn't make it any easier to go through the pain that you're in. I'm not saying that that helps your pain at all because the pain sucks. Yes or no? Yeah. Oh man, it does. When I'm in it, I hate it. But at least I know what good is and I will focus on the good and it will elevate me above the bad. Come on, say focus on the good. Say it again, say focus on the good. 
There is always more going on behind the scenes than you can see. You trust that God is good and that God's got a plan and God's going to get you through this. This is Job 42, verses 10 and 12. So now we're at the very end of the book. We summarized. We went from the beginning, first chapters. Now we're on the last chapter, the happily ever after thing, because you get the beginning and the crisis, and now we're all the way to happily ever after, because we only have 40 minutes to have a whole conversation about this awesome book that you should hopefully read this week. Psalm 40, or Job 42. The Lord restored Job's losses at the end. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he ever had before. The Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. In fact, the favorite way for me to say that is God gave Job double for his trouble. God gave Job, come on, say double for my trouble. Okay, 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 and this, 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 you just stay, stay with me, okay, just like right now. Like don't, don't get off of this right now. Do you stay really, really connected, okay? When you're going through tough stuff, And you remind yourself that in my pain, God's got a plan. On the other side of this, he gonna give me double for my trouble. If I just stay in this and I I trust him and I stay faithful and I'm not gonna get, I'm not gonna get all all angry and frustrated and bitter and complain. I'm just gonna trust that he's got a plan and I'm gonna walk with him through this no matter how hard it is. He will give you double for your trouble. In fact, you know, in the New Testament, Jesus says, for all of you that have been persecuted, and you've, he actually lists a bunch of stuff. He lost land and houses and relationships and all this kind of stuff. He says, in eternity, you will get multitudes over. But you have to trust that though this life is short, eternity is long. And though you might have pain for a temporary moment, you will have an eternity eternity of blessing when you walk with him. We tend to focus on temporary pain rather than an entire eternity of blessing. I don't know the situation you're in. I don't know what you're facing. I, I don't want to minimize it at all. So my dad died of dementia after preaching the gospel for years. I watched his life slowly fall apart. I watched my mother's pain watching this man of God suddenly not be able to put sentences together. It sucked! It just did. But I will trust that he is good and that he has a plan and I will walk with him and worship him because if I don't, The only alternative is bitterness, anger, discouragement, and frustration. Come on, say there's always more going on. There's a backstage that you don't get to see that God knows what he is doing. He's directing the play, and he trusts that you, come on, say I can get through it. Come on, say there's double for my trouble. Now, having said all that, where is Jesus in the book of Job? Because remember, every book of Scripture has a conversation about Jesus because the Jesus is the focus of every book. Like Job, Jesus is attacked multiple pi- times by Satan and overcomes. Like Job, Jesus is attacked multiple times by Satan and overcomes. In fact, uh, James, can you hand me that communion that's next to you? The reason why we did communion the way we did it tonight was on purpose. Because I wanted you to know, if we're going to have a conversation about pain, let's talk about his first. Christ came to earth to understand your pain. In Islam, God is distant. Allah does not relate to humanity. He stays at a distance. In Buddhism, the point of life is to just accept suffering, and that's it. In Hinduism... You die and get reincarnated and go through pain and then more 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 pain. pain. In Christianity, God came to earth to understand your pain. He came to earth to set you free from sin, Satan, and suffering. And someday when he splits the sky... 
there will be no more crying, tears, mourning, and revelation is clear, or pain. Because he has conquered it at the cross. This is why we follow Jesus, because though he sees our pain, he experienced the same thing, so he could be like us and understand us, and then he conquers it, so that someday you will never experience pain again. Now, when you think about the life of Christ, he really did get attacked a lot by Satan, so I'll put it on the screen. Satan tries and fails to kill Jesus at his birth, Matthew chapter 2. Satan, or Jesus defeats Satan in the wilderness temptation with, four, with uh, three different temptations. And then Jesus triumphs over Satan at the cross, Colossians 2, verse 15, which says this. It says, Jesus disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. That's what now, you know what's going on? Physical realm, cross. Spiritual realm, backstage. Jesus is winning over demons at the cross. Jesus disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the... Oh, man. Come on. Is that good news, yes or no? What you have to understand is, yes, Jesus went through all that pain, but the cool thing is, even greater than Job, is he kicked Satan's butt at the cross. So that someday when Satan, when Jesus splits the sky, Satan will be permanently locked in hell forever and there will be no more backstage manipulation. (laughs) There's just front stage joy. Is that good news? All right, let's apply all this. Let's just apply all this just for a minute. Four ways. God is so much, come on, say greater. Greater. God is so much greater than Satan. Satan can't touch you without God's permission. So you pray for you and your family's protection. You pray for you and your family's protection. What that means for me is I pray over my wife and my kids and my grandkids and every pastor of FGU and their wives and their kids every day. Literally every day, I am constantly praying over, God put protection around, don't let them get attacked. It's why Jesus prayed in the garden, lead us not into temptation. Ask God to protect you from it, from hardship and pain and struggle. Now, you won't always get out of it, but there could have been a whole lot that Satan wanted to do, but because you prayed protection, he wasn't allowed to do it. You will live a much more blessed life if you just remind yourself to pray protection over your family and your friends and your loved ones. Does that make sense? Second, number two. Number two, when you go through hard things, know that God believes in you. Come on, say, God believes in me. Say it again. Say, God believes in me. He believes you're not a wimp. You're not a wuss. He believes that you're not a whiner. He believes you can get past it, that you can overcome it, that you will get through it, that no matter what happens, you are more than a conqueror through him who loves you. You either believe this and win, or you get mad and you lose. Come on, say, he believes in me. Number three, number three, don't foolishly underestimate Satan. His power is real. Do not foolishly underestimate the devil. His power is real. Now, this part is important because so often you think things are just physical. And there is spiritual reality. There's stuff going on behind the scenes that you don't know about. And you just don't recognize it. And you lose so many of the, the, the fights you're in because you didn't recognize that Satan was back there manipulating stuff to begin with. When you're in a fight with your spouse, that's spiritual, not physical. It's always spiritual. When you fail at a temptation, it's because there's a spiritual being behind you wanting you to fail and be discouraged and be in despair. You're always at war. There's always stuff going on behind the curtain. First Peter 5 verse 8, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. Wait, 
that, 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 I'm reading that. <laughs> watch, <laughs> watch out for your, watch out they don't turn the slide. <laughs> watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He's, remember I told you at the beginning, we read the verse, he's wandering around on planet Earth. He's got minions that are wandering around the planet designed to ruin your life. So wake up, pay attention. Things are not as just front stage as you think. Don't let the devil win a victory. Ephesians 6, 12. We are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. That means when you do get in a fight with your spouse, you're actually fighting demons and not each other. But against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, the backstage guys, against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in heavenly places. Now, that doesn't mean every time you get a disease, the devil, the devil gave you like a headache or the devil gave you cancer. That's not, what, that's not what the scriptures would teach. Things are very physical in our world and they're very spiritual. But when you get sick, maybe you should start with a prayer instead of just a Tylenol. Maybe we start with prayer and ask God to do something supernatural and then we move on to doctors who God gave us to physically be healed. Come on, say it's both. It's both. You live. You live front stage and backstage. You live in this world, and there's still a spiritual world. So you still have to function in the physical while knowing the spiritual exists. So you still use medicine and common sense, but you also pray and you pay attention because the enemy's real. And then last, number four, don't lose your faith. During adversity, God blesses those, or you could write in rewards if you like that word better. God rewards or blesses those who persevere. God promises, this is James chapter 1 verse 12. He says, blessed is the man who remains steadfast. Everybody say steadfast. Steadfast. Come on, say steadfast. steadfast. Steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God promises to those who love him. In other words, God believes in you so much that if you will just stay in it to win it, when you come on the other side of this, God's going to be the one to high five you. God's going to be the one to say, I'm proud of you. God's going to be the one to hug you and be like, I'm so, I can't believe you, you did awesome, man. And none of us are going to do this perfectly because we're still human. Only Jesus did it perfectly. But you do the best you can to worship your way through it. Was this helpful tonight? Let me pray for you. You can just close your eyes and bow your head for a second. So now think about your life. Think about what you're facing. Maybe there's something that you keep venting on God and you just need to worship God. You just need to trust him in pain. Trust him in the hardship. I'm gonna lead us in a simple prayer. It's not a magic prayer, but it's a prayer of us, of, of our trust in spite of what we face and what we go through. Just say, Jesus Christ, Tonight, I trust you again. I believe you have a plan for my life. I believe you're good. And so I'm gonna worship you. I'm gonna follow you. My life is yours and I trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to stand to your feet. If you'd like to be baptized, Pastor Silas is up here in the front. We've got short shirts, towels, chlorinated water, a pastor that happily baptize you. Next week we're doing Psalms. I think it's ironic that today, tonight we were in Job, which is the book of pain. Next week we're in Psalms, which is the book of worship. So the way you get through your pain is with your worship. That's what we're going to talk about next week. We're just, we're just going to end with our final blessing. Say this out loud with me. God, be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us that his way may be known on earth, his saving power among all nations. I love you. Have a great week.